think I was supposed to teach on some offering a little bit. And I see that you took your offering. So much Crosspoint is giving, you don't even need to teach anymore. <laughs> but I will still push the button a little bit, all right? Project Second Corinthians for me. Probably somebody didn't give that you will be giving. As Pastor Kofi said on, Friday, on front line, he said, this is the only church where they don't ask people to give. <laughs> it's time we start asking people to give. I say, I take note. You know when God speaks, I take note. Let me share a few words before we get into the word. Amen? Can we read together, church? Can we do that together? With your beautiful... Make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Everybody say the grace of God. Grace. Everybody. Grace of God. That was 80%. Everybody. Grace. Thank you. Next, that in that great trial of affliction. Stop there. Say great trial of affliction. Say it again. Let's keep reading. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of the liver. Keep that verse. You know, sometimes there's things in the Bible that look like it's very contradictory. Now, we talk about a grace upon them. Then in verse 2, it begins to describe to us their condition. And it starts with great trial of affliction. You know, when the Bible says you're rich, don't calculate how much money the person has. He, he was really rich. When the Bible says you're poor, don't try to calculate how poor they were. He really poor. All right? When the Bible says this person was wicked, don't calculate. It was wickedness. The Bible does not compromise. It tells you things the way they were. So when they say it was a great trial of affliction, trust me, it was not just somebody took your chair and you're angry or they, they fire you at work or somebody mistreated you and betrayed you. This was a great trial of affliction. In the midst of the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. Is that going together? Naturally speaking. You know, because when you're in a great trial of affliction, there's no abundance of joy. But this church... In the great trial of the affliction, the abundance of joy. And then it went on, between affliction and joy, deep poverty. <clears throat> that word deep, in the Greek, it is the bottomless of the sea. In other words, there was no room to be more poor than this. That was the lowest level that you can reach as a poor person. You can go down to the bottom. So we have great trial, abundance of joy, and deep poverty. Strong words. Great trial, abundance of joy, and deep poverty in one church. Great trial, abundance of joy, as a sandwich, deep poverty. Doesn't make sense to the mind. Because when you're in great trial, there is no abundance of joy. And how can you have abundance of joy when you're in deep poverty? And then it added the riches of the liberality. Strong words all seem contradictory. But yet, it begins with the fact that they had a grace. Do you understand? Yeah. Keep reading. Verse 3. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Now, he said, in their strength, they give. What strength? Deep poverty strength. Bottomless. You can't go lower than that. They give. Out of tribulations, abundance of joy. He said, I witnessed it. Nobody didn't tell me. I am here to testify. Next. Imploring us. Now, that's another strong word, implore. In other words, they kneel down begging. Please, let we give. What do you mean, let you give? You are in trouble, in tribulation. You are the deepest bottom of poverty. And then you, you are begging to give. Doesn't make sense. You should be exempt from giving. We should give you a special paper and say, because of your deep poverty, please, this is not for you. 
let those who are on the surface and above the surface give. But for you who are there, the poor, who don't have a job, who is on the welfare, who just lost a job, who has some crisis, please, wait, wait. When the job come back and finances begin to flow, then, and only then, you qualify to give. But for today, you are exempt because God understands your condition. Deep poverty. No, 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 no. It didn't say that. Sometimes we think it is the rich we need to give. Sometimes we think it's when I have much I need to give. That is a natural thinking pattern. The spiritual thinking pattern give from the perspective of grace. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, I want to provoke you. There's a realm of genera generosity you cannot get in even if you want. Even if you want to be a giver, you won't be able. Even though you know I should give, just I want to give. I'm going to be among the, the generous people in the ministry, in the house of God. You know, that great willingness you have won't help you. You need grace. You are not generous because you want. You are generous because you have tapped into the grace to be generous. There is a grace for generosity. That's why a deep poverty becomes liberal in giving. It doesn't make sense. Why? Because they receive the grace of liberality and generosity. You cannot do it because you cannot be generous because you have money. You cannot be generous because you want. That's why a lot of people in the house of God don't give. Even though they love the Lord, they believe in the vision. And they are excited about God. But yet, they don't have a grace to give. That's challenging you. So you want to, but you end up not being a giver. Because you lack the grace of healing, the grace of receiving, but you have not embraced the grace of generosity that make you give even when you can afford to give. It is beyond mathematics. Do you understand that? That's what I want to share with you today. There is a grace. Let's read quickly the other verse before I get into it. I'm feeling God moving in my spirit right now. Verse 5, quickly. And not only we had hoped, but they first gave themselves. You see? If you don't give yourself first, you won't give. So people don't give without giving themselves. They first what? So number one, give. It is you to give yourself. And only then you can give what you have. If you can't give who you are, you cannot give what you have. They first give themselves to who? Comma. And don't stop to the Lord only. Because today you don't see the Lord standing here. You see pastors. If you don't give yourself to the Lord and to the vision of the house, you won't be a giver. You see, it didn't say or. It make a comma. That means the sentence is not over yet. It's a continuation of the same thought. They gave themselves to the Lord, comma, and to us. That's why the people of Israel understood the 300 men. To the Lord and to Gideon. So it's never just to the Lord. I'll tell leaders, you will be a bad leader if you just love God and you don't love me. Because loving God is your own with him. We cannot measure that. But loving your pastor or your apostle, we can measure it. And, and, and you cannot operate in the vision if you just love only God and you hate your leader. So you got to give yourself to God and to the people who need you. That means you got to trust God and trust the people who need you. Praise the Lord. Did you receive something? So stand up on your feet and let me release a grace. So we all can become a little bit more generous. We all can become a little bit more givers. Because you can't do it in your own strength. Because when you look at your bills and you look at what comes in, you get intimidated by your condition. But this one here is grace that will empower you to become crazy like the Macedonian church. I say crazy. Lift up your hand. Say, Father, here I am. I give myself to you, 
and I give you all my resources. Today, I receive the same grace that was open. The Macedonian church has come upon me and my family and my business and my finances in the name of Jesus. I receive it today on my behalf and my children and my descendants in the name of Jesus. We will be generous to change the lives of the people around us to be contributors and be givers, not takers. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your hand together, have a sin, the prayer of the Lord. You know, as I told you, I give thanks to God for three months going and seek the Lord and sabbatical. I appreciate our board members, the leadership, the pastors, the people who stood together doing an amazing work and believing in rest. Hallelujah. I recover what I have lost. You know, last Sunday I can prophesy on 1,000 plus people without stopping. Because God made me recover my gift that I've lost. At one time in this city, they called me the prophet of the street. Until my son came forth and he was diagnosed. And it killed something in me. My faith began to die. I lost my boldness. And then the busyness and the cares of life. and it, You name it. Until I went away and I began to write a book on notes that I've used in the past and I called that book Prophesy. It's written, it is ready. The more I was tapping in the words and the chapters, something was waking up within me. It's the greatest gift I received during my time away. And I'm grateful. Very grateful. I can't do ministry any other way. Let me share with you a few things, all right? Quickly. You know, without the prophetic gifts, purpose is unknown. The people in the church, they love Christ, but they don't know what Christ has for them. I have quenched this teaching for the youngest time, longest time, because I feel like I don't qualify anymore. But I qualify because God qualified me. When the prophetic gift is not operating, people park. They give up. They backslide sitting in the same place. And at the end, they just point fingers on people. But the reality is it's nobody's fault. A prophetic gifts create motion. You know what my desire? That everyone in this church, from the youngest to the oldest, will prophesy. Amen. And it's biblical. When we talk about prophecy, please, I'm just speaking, all right? Let me just flow, all right? Leave, leave, uh, leave stuff alone. There is three dimensions in the prophetic, or at least three dimensions of the channel God used in the prophetic. Number one, is those who are born prophets. There are individuals who are born prophets. Somebody said, but they didn't know Jesus yet. But God, God called them prophets. And the first example is Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1.1, 1, 1, it goes like this. Before you were formed in the womb of your mother, I have known you and I have called you to be what? A prophet. Did you go to church yet? No. Is a born prophet. That's the number one. My goal is not to develop all those stuff because in the book I talk about it. Number two, it is those who are prophet because of who they sit under or who they serve. There are people who are not born prophet, but because of who they serve, they become. Did you get that? An example, Elisha. Everybody thinks Elisha was a prophet. Elisha was not a prophet. I say Elisha. 
Elisha was a farmer. Until he began to serve the prophetic mantle, then he became one. Did you catch me? You, you're catching me. Elisha was a farmer. Somebody say that. Until he began to serve an anointing. And he bought into that anointing, even though he was not intended to be one. I tell people, you can make something about your life depend on where you are positioned. And number three, we have profit by situation or condition or need. <laughs> Project me Amos, please. Amos, I want to show you the third type there. We have one who's born, one by position, by serving, and the third one because there's a need. Somebody said the world has needs. You gotta catch this. It doesn't apply only to the prophetic, it applies to everything. Sometimes God, because of the need that operates in an area, will use you to become an expert or to operate in a domain that normally you're not supposed to, just because of the need. Amen. And that is what I want to mention to you today. The world is full of needs. And God wanna qualify some people who never thought that there would be the solution in those areas. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. Did you get that? I was what? No Nor was I the son of a prophet. In other words, I did not serve somebody. I didn't sit under Elijah. I did not wash his feet. I didn't invest in the anointing. I was not a prophet. I was not the son of the prophet. I was not in the school of the prophet. I was not to be one. I was not to be around it. I am a farmer. And then he continue. But I was what? A sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. In other words, is a cultivator and a shepherd. Yet, because there was a need. And God looked around, there was nobody who was a prophet by birth or a prophet by service. So God said, you know what? I have no time to waste. I got to get this thing done somehow. You know what? Pastor Julia, you don't qualify. You were never intended for it. You were never locked into it. But guess what? I need somebody to change the world business. And this area, I don't have anybody, so I use you. You see? That's the way God want to work in the earth today. So the qualified co-code, when they are not around, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm not supposed to be a banker, but just in case you need a representative there, and those who are born to be, or those who serve to become, they are not around. Hey, shift my status. Change my job description. Take me from the sheepfold and send me to speak to the people of Israel. That's it. Are you catching me? We're going somewhere? Project me John chapter 3. This one is vital before we begin to minister to people. Listen to this. He said, there was what? Say a man. a man of the yes. named a ruler. You don't want to miss this, all right? We're going to have baptism coming soon. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You don't want to miss this. This is very important. This is why you feel stuck. <laughs> this is why you get frustrated by life. This is what makes you feel like, oh, you know what, enough is enough. It's because of the church where I go. I need to change church. Probably thing will change. I need to change husband. That's what thing will change. I need to change city. That thing will change. Ah, I'm changing the job. You know, people keep changing, changing, yeah. thinking by changing, thing will be better. But the reality is there is only thing, one thing to change. It is for you to have understanding about who you are. That's all. Because when you know who you are, you can be in the desert and, and produce oranges. But some people, some people think their condition will change because they move from city to another one or from a church to another one or I, I move from this region. Nonsense. God is the God of the earth. And the fullness, they all belong to him. So your move means nothing. Are you ready? They said there was a man and he was a what? Say it. Who was he? A Pharisee. Somebody say Pharisee. Everybody say it. Everybody say Pharisee. And what was his name? So we have the office of the person. We have the name of the person. And the third one, he was a ruler. Somebody say ruler. ruler. That is his function. Yeah. So I have the office. I have the name. And I have the function. 
Do you know those three things about you? Mandagaya. Do you know your office? Do you know your name? And do you know your function? You catch me? Now let me help you a little bit more. Because if you don't know those three things, you will be moving from place to place and be dissatisfied every year. You will plan and you will be mad and you will be angry and you want to drop up because you are looking for something somewhere and it's in those three things. You need to know your office. You need to know your name. My God, let me talk about the name. You know, <laughs> there is a name in the spirit. That is your name. It's not Kofi. Kofi is the name your father gives you. And you honor that. You agree? Jide is the name your father gives you. And we honor that. And your father's name can be your spiritual name, but not 100% all the time. That's right. Amen. Kennedy might be the name your father gives you. It can correspond to your spiritual name, but doesn't mean it is. We need to seek God to know who we are in the spirit. Yes. So the father of Abraham called him Abram. And God said, that's the name of your father, but it does not connect. It's not corresponding to the destiny I have for you. Therefore, I will reveal to you the name that I have called you by before the foundation of time. Before it, then you were born. Do you know your name? Do you know your name? I'm not talking about, today when people are going to have children, they want on Google and one cute name. You know? Jeremitia, Sikitia, Redikitia. Leave it alone! You just want a cute name that is cool. We are so carnal. But no matter what name you give them, even if it's not their spiritual name, at one time they will have to discover. You see? That's why we have problem to know who we are. Yeah, so they come Abram. God said, good job. You were close. Because he's exalted father. Good name. It's really nice. But exalted father doesn't cut it. Because there's only one exalted father and it's me. That's right. So don't call him exalted father. Right. I will call him Abraham. The father of many nations. Let's keep him on earth. Don't take him in heaven. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? Let's keep him in the nation. Because by Abraham, he cannot fulfill his calling. Many people are struggling because they have not yet discovered who they are in the spirit. God dealt with me. My name is Suleiman Elhaj Diallo. When I was at Polytechnic, they used to give my, my grant and my scholarship to a Senegalese man who had the same name as me, called Suleiman El Hajj Diallo. So I had enough of it every semester I have to call to reverse it. So I shifted my name and I said El Hajj Suleiman Diallo. In the course of time, the name Suleiman disappeared. When I was on my three months, God spoke to me and said, I call you Suleiman. That means Solomon. That's why I gave you in functionality wisdom, caring, and peace. Did you catch me? Are you catching me? So my name is Suleiman. Or if you don't like to pronounce it because you think it's a Muslim name, it's Arabic, you can call me Solomon. Because Solomon is my name as God knows it. Solomon was a man of wisdom. Solomon was a man of peace. I love peace. I don't like fight. I don't like strife. Are you hearing me? I'm a unity man. And the greatest gift God gave me is not preaching his wisdom. And I know it and I say it and I'm proud of it and I'm not ashamed of it because it's the truth. I am a wise man. <laughs> Period. So you need to know your name. Is Jeff the name God gave? Let's go find out. Doesn't mean we go now to the registry to change our name. I'm just saying you need to know. Honor your parent by keeping your name. But at the end of the day, in the spiritual matters, can I go further? Yes. Saul was a killer on the road of Damascus. He destroyed people until Jesus met him on the road of Damascus. And they call him what now? Saul. They call him what now? Saul. From Saul to? Saul. When the demon began to beat the son of this man, he said, 
Jesus we know. And who else? Did he say Saul? Because Saul is not known in the spiritual realm. He said, Paul, because it's Paul that they know in the spiritual realm. Do they know Jeff in the spiritual realm or there's another name? Saul. No, no, we don't know Saul. Demons say we don't know Saul. We know Paul. We know Paul. We know the spiritual name. We know the God naming you. That one has authority. That one has recognition. That one has power. Not Saul. What's your name? Elizabeth. Good name. But what is your spiritual name? That is known in the spiritual realm. I'm loving this too much now. Can I go further? Jacob. Good name. But that one cannot fulfill destiny. So we have to call you out. That's your spiritual name, known in heaven and in the earth. When spirituals, when Israel speak, nation listen and Pharaoh listen. But when Joseph speaks, they say, Who's who? when Jacob speaks, they say, Who's this guy? Just, just Jacob is a runner, he's a fugitive. But when Israel show up, there is no more arrangement. You see that? So today, I'm challenging you. According to John 3.1, he was a Pharisee. That was his office. What is your office? My office is an apostle office. I have an apostolic office. Even when I was a pastor, even when I was not born, I have an apostolic office. And I can see it through my whole life. Even when I was not a Christian, I was an apostolic office. Because what I used to do in the secular world was to go in different cities and open accounts. I was apostolically operating in the secular world. I have an apostolic office. My functioning, it is wisdom and care. That's why I'm a pastor and I'm a good one. Amen. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. So it's very important. Number word, it's not because I prophesy that I'm a prophet. Because I can be prophesying as a function, but not of the office. Let me, let me now hit you really hard. You know that some pastors, they've been doing this church thing for 30 years, but they have 12 people in the churches. It is a struggle. Struggle, struggle, struggle. And they are wondering, I'm using the example for pastors. It can apply to business and anything else. I mean, they are struggling forever. Struggling. The question is, many people, because of the functionality, they think they belong to that office. It's not because you have a heart for people that you're pastoral that means you're a pastor. It's not because you prophesy that means you're a prophet. Do you understand? Yeah. So your functionality is not always connected to your office. Okay, let's take it and talk about Lucifer. Lucifer, nowhere in the Bible, the Bible says, or God says he was a worshiper. If you see that verse, please tell me. Where God says, oh, Lucifer, son of the morning sun, worshiper. No, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> Lucifer was an archangel. In the same category as Michael and Gabriel. They are called glory angel or cherubim. He was from the category of, category of cherubim. He was in the dimension and rulership of cherubim. The cherubim are glory angel. They are close to God. They smell the glory. The worshiper in heaven was not cherubim. They were seraphim. The seraphim lead worship. And they do the worship in their office. They dance before the Lord. So, Lucifer was a cherubim in the function of a worship. But not in the office of worship. Are you catching me? So, be careful. It's not because you are good at something, or you are anointed in doing something, automatically you are of that office. So, office, name, functionality. I pray this helps somebody. I pray it helps you. Praise the Lord. You know, Pastor Nida, I want to give you a word. I feel like I'm going to sing a song. No, I, Luga, 
más alto, más grande que estar a tus pies, que estar a tus pies. No hay lugar. You see, sometimes you're wondering, Lord, what next for me now? I'm a pastor, but functioning out. But God said, you see, the greatest ministry he has called you to do in this season is no must, no high, no place more higher, more greater than be at the feet of Jesus Christ. That's your ministry. No high lugar, mas alto, mas grande, que estar a sus pies. Los pies del Señor. So don't worry. Because the ministry is coming to you this season is not doing. It's not achieving. It's not ministering to human beings. But rather, to minister to him. As his peers. That's your ministry. Amen. And that's enough for this season. Until new order. So no more pressure, no more questioning, no more confusion. But the ministry God called you today, it is to be at his feet and minister to him. And that's enough. Amen. Can we put a hand to Lord? <laughs> it's important you know. It's important you know. What is your office? It's important you understand. What is your name? This name thing is huge. Very important. And your functionality. So you don't get up stuck in the wrong place. Being a pastor, I'm starting a church now. Because I love people. Because I have a pastoring gift. It's a functionality. It does not convert automatically into an office. You need to make sure. I don't call myself a prophet because I prophesy. That's not my office. It's the office of these people. Prophet Okema and Martha, can I go further? Now, let's see now, office and functionality, just to blow your head off, all right? Check this out. Abraham was a prophet. Because when he lied about his wife, and Pharaoh wanted to mess up with her, at the night, he had a dream, Pharaoh. And the Lord himself spoke to Pharaoh and said, Hey, buddy, don't touch this girl. Because if you touch her, you're done. He is my prophet. Somebody say prophet. God himself said that Abraham is a prophet, but he never prophesied. Because Abraham was a prophet in the office of prophets, but his functionality was faith. His functionality was faith. That's why he's called the father of faith. He didn't go prophesying and do prophetic things like Elijah. But yet, he was a prophet. So in the office of the prophet does not mean your functionality will always be prophecies. So you can have an evangelist. Stand up. By the way, put your hand together for him. You've done an amazing job in Africa. Everywhere you go, I had reports. And the report was phenomenal. And I was so proud. They said, he's wise like you. You see, that's the glory of a father. Because you are wise. He's an evangelist. Who will function as a prophet by prophecy. But doesn't make him a prophet. He remains in the office of the evangelist. That's the way God works. So I, I want to throw all this stuff at you so we can reposition ourselves properly in the kingdom, even in this church. Are you catching me, somebody? So you understand clearly what God is doing. I don't know. I feel this name popping in my head. Rosa, Rosaline, Rosa. Rosa. Somebody here, Rosaline, Rosalina, Rosalie, Rosa. Rosa, come here. Can we put our hand together to encourage this mama? <laughs> Hallelujah. I want we walk together a little bit. You know, life has its up and its down. 
The greatest gift God gives to a mother is nurturing. That's why a mother cares for their children. And so much sometimes that we become so discouraged and so beaten, we lose sleep. And God wants me to let you know, you are caring for your child, don't you? Your baby girl, the youngest. What's her name? Is she here today? Tell me, are you here? Come here, baby girl. Come on, put your hand together for her. So you're the baby girl of the family? I am, yes. And your name is? Tamika Beth. And you have two more sisters? I do. They are older than you? Yeah. Are they here? Um, one is, my other one is. One here. is here. Mama care for you. In fact, she's even concerned for you, isn't it? So much. Because you love her so much. You know why you're concerned for her so much? It's because she's the priest of your family, I told you. You are the priest. You know what it means, priest? It means among your sibling, God has put his hand on you and said, this one, she will be speaking my word, just like what I'm doing right now. That's what God's saying for you. You know the challenge here today? God wants to take every addiction that you have to any substance and turn it to him. Do you want? Because if you don't want, it's okay. But do you want God to take any addiction, open your life, and transfer it for you to be addicted to him? You want that? Okay. Out of the few substances you're addicted to, which one you want to let go? Or... Probably all of them. Don't be afraid because God will change your life today and will not be the same again. Do you understand? I want you to be free and speak to these people you don't know what you want God to free you from. Say it. Addiction of smoking. Smoking what? Say it. Don't be afraid. Say it. Marijuana. Marijuana. And what else? That's all. So if he take that from you, you will be addicted to him. So mama can sleep a little bit. Do you want that? <laughs> Lift up your hand now. I would like you to stand up on your feet and we'll believe God for a miracle for this dear, beautiful servant of God. You are a servant of God. I say you are the servant of God. You are a servant of God. You are a woman of God. You are a child of God. You are a mighty child of God. You are a mighty woman of God. You are a world changer for God. You are a voice in the hand of the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come in agreement and we break the yoke of that addiction over our life today in Jesus' mighty name. Be loose in Jesus' name. We break the grip of that devil over our life. Lord, we take her out of the confusion to bring her in the light, to know your will. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise, mighty woman of God. Walk in the path of righteousness. Walk in the ways of the Lord. Speak for the counsel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Say, Lord Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus. Forgive me for all my sins. Today, today, I give you my life completely and totally. I will serve you. I will come back home. I will stand in your path and I will be a light. Say, I will be a light in the darkness and a voice to those who have no voice. In the name of Jesus. I want you to say to mommy, Mama, forgive me. 